Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. In today's episode, I'll be talking about the stem bulb tester that I made. I'll go through the schematic and describe how I built it, demonstrate how I use it, describe the unique AC voltmeter that I built for it, and discuss its practical limitations. Even though it's not very large, it weighs in at a hefty 20 pounds, and most of that weight is copper. Now, it's not likely to win any awards for most beautiful instrument of the year, but trust me, it's got it where it counts on the inside. So what do I use this thing for? Its primary function is to apply controlled levels of voltage and current to AC power gear, especially older vacuum tube gear or any device that I've performed repairs on or a device in unknown condition. As compared to just plugging a device under test, or DUT for short, directly into the AC mains and flipping the on switch and crossing my fingers that it'll work fine, the dim bulb tester first and foremost increases my level of personal safety, and second, it greatly reduces the risk of causing significant damage to a compromised DUT. If you've been keeping up with my channel, you will have seen me use the dim bulb tester after I repaired the power supply on the Halicrafters HT40. That was a perfect example. I needed to safely power up that radio after I made extensive repairs, and to do it in a controlled manner that would minimize releasing the magic smoke in case I made a serious mistake in the wiring. The way it works is pretty simple. You plug the dim bulb tester into AC mains, then plug your DUT into the dim bulb tester. Next you turn on the DUT and slowly crank up the AC voltage while watching the light bulb. If you can reach full output and the light bulb doesn't glow brightly, then it is highly likely that there isn't anything catastrophically wrong with the power circuit in your DUT. That's the significance of the dim bulb name for this kind of tester. However, if the bulb starts glowing brightly, then that likely means the DUT has an issue, possibly even a direct short, and you need to stop the test and investigate. I'll demonstrate what a fault looks like by deliberately making a short circuit in an old lamp cord. You can see that as I apply increasing voltage, the light bulb comes on and glows brightly. That's the indicator that something is amiss and you need to stop the test. My dim bulb tester is a combination of four main elements. A variable auto transformer, or more commonly called a variac, an isolation transformer, an incandescent light bulb, and an AC voltmeter. Along with a case and some 3D printed parts that I designed, its overall construction is pretty simple. Now there's really nothing revolutionary I did here to build my dim bulb tester. Guys have been combining variacs and isolation transformers and light bulbs for decades to make these devices. In my case, I did have to find a housing to put everything in, and that's where maybe a bit of controversy might come up. You see, I bought an old Heathkit A01 audio oscillator at a ham fest for the bargain price of five bucks, and it was a perfect size to put all these elements in. Now, it's always a concern anytime you consider tearing up an old piece of electronic gear, something from Heathkit in particular, to repurpose, but in this case, there's a few important factors to, to be aware of. Uh, first and foremost, it was just in terrible condition. It was missing parts uh, both inside and out. It had a lot of cosmetic damage on the front case, a lot of uh, cover rather, um, a lot of scratches, and it just was not in, in, in good shape and would have taken a lot of time and money and effort to restore. And then it kind of leads to the second point that even if I had restored it, it still would have been a Heathkit A01 oscillator. And they're just not spectacular from a performance standpoint. So there's really nothing intrinsically uh, great about the value of the device other than sentimental value. And third, you can get a modern audio oscillator that would run circles around this. So there's at the end of the day, you really wouldn't have a device that would be that useful anyway. So... The value that I'm getting out of repurposing its carcass into a dim bulb tester is far greater than I would have for restoring it to its original state. So kind of consider that argument settled. So I'll move on now to describe its internal workings. Here's a simplified schematic of how I built my dim bulb tester. But before I go through each element, here's a word from Captain Obvious. 
This item contains hazardous voltage and safety precautions must be followed. If you're following along and working on your own version, you're doing so at your own risk. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Now, let's start with the light bulb. It's just a regular old incandescent light bulb. The wattage and style of the bulb is important, and I'll talk about that later. Now, notice that it's connected in series with the rest of the circuit. Here, the light bulb is being used as a poor man's current limiting device. Using it this way, if there was a very low resistance load, let's say a dead short connected to the dim bulb tester, the bulb will establish a maximum current limit that doesn't exceed what you would get from just plugging the light bulb directly into power. Now back to the bulb specifics. First and most important, it has to be an incandescent light bulb. And even better, a clear glass bulb because you can see the filament better as it glows, although frosted will still work just fine. Now compact fluorescent and LED bulbs absolutely will not work here. Those bulbs work under a completely different principle. What we're exploiting here is the fact that incandescent bulbs don't have a fixed resistance. The resistance of an incandescent bulb filament is low at low temperature and high at high temperature. And the more current you put through it, the hotter it gets. As its resistance climbs, that also means the voltage drop across the bulb is not constant. Now the actual equations relating resistance and voltage drop to the applied current are nonlinear, and just to make them even more gnarly, they also depend on the wattage of the bulb and the time the current is applied. Instead of bumbling through a bunch of math I don't fully understand myself, what I'll do instead here in a moment is show the actual response curves for my dim bulb tester, and it'll be clear to see how the voltage at the DOT varies depending upon which wattage bulb I use and the wattage of the DOT. Now keep in mind, this method doesn't limit current exactly the same way as a current limited power supply would. The reason is because of the voltage drop across the bulb, and that means your DOT won't ever see full mains AC when the bulb is in series with it. And that's why I have this bypass switch here. It allows bypassing the bulb after the DOT has shown me it didn't malfunction. Closing this bypass switch will apply full mains voltage to the variac. Okay, so moving on to the variac. Now, the proper technical name for this device is a variable auto transformer, but most people just call them a variac, which actually is a trademark that apparently General Radio first started using back in the 1930s. But like a lot of trademarks, it's become genericized and it's being used as just a generic name for a variable auto transformer. At first glance, these things look kind of like a giant potentiometer, but they don't work like a pot. A potentiometer doesn't provide any transforming action, a variac does. They function mostly like a regular transformer, there's just a single winding instead of a separate primary and secondary winding. Using a variable auto transformer allows the user to select a percentage of the primary voltage to appear at the secondary. So the variac and the incandescent bulb work together. The variac is providing an adjustable limit to the voltage supplied to the DUT, and the incandescent bulb is providing an upper limit to the current supply to the DUT. One limitation of the variac is it does not provide electrical isolation between mains power and the DUT. Notice that there is a shared terminal, the neutral terminal, between the primary side and the secondary side. That means if you connect your DUT directly to the variac, the neutral on the DUT would be connected directly to the mains neutral, which is undesirable for some testing and could be dangerous in some cases, in particular for testing a hot chassis radio, for example. So that's where the isolation transformer comes into play. It's a one-to-one -one turns ratio transformer and provides isolation for the DUT from the mains power. Notice that I am using a three-wire plug and the ground pin is connected to the case of the dim bulb tester and to the ground pin of the AC input. I did that on purpose because when I'm testing a DUT that has a three-wire plug on it, I generally don't want the case on the DUT floating, I want it grounded. But of course, if my DUT had only a two-wire cord, it will be isolated from panel ground. There is some debate about what order to build a device like this, meaning should you put the isolation transformer first or put the variac first? And each approach has its own advantages. In my case, I decided to put the variac first for one simple logical reason. It has the higher volt amp rating, and looking at the entire construction from a power loss standpoint, it makes sense to go with the big boy first. The last of the four main elements is the AC voltmeter. I placed it across the output of the isolation transformer because of the voltage drops in the bulb and in the variac and in the isolation transformer. 
I want an accurate reading of the voltage applied to the DUT, so that's why the measurement is taken at the socket. Now I built this meter from a design I found online, and I've included a link to it in the description in case you are interested. But be warned, there are a couple of errors that I found in the design and had to fix. And also I will say it's a real Rube Goldberg idea by modern standards. There are definitely easier ways today to build an AC voltmeter, but I had my own reasons for choosing this design, mainly because I already had most of the parts, including the large um, seven segment LED displays in my junk box. And I was enamored by the way the design works and really wanted to give it a try. So I'd recommend you consider these factors before you try to copy it. All that said, at the end of this video, I'll go through the workings of the meter for those of you who are really curious about it. So why didn't I also include an ammeter on my dim bulb tester? Well, the reason is I'm rarely, if ever, interested in quantifying the ampere draw of a DUT. Most devices that I intend to repair or need to verify normal operation on don't have a manufacturer's spec with tolerance for its current draw. Power is often specified, but that's also not much of interest when doing diagnostics. If I really need to know amperage, I can always improvise a connection to one of my DMMs and get a quantitative reading. Otherwise, the qualitative glow of the light bulb is all I need to know. Okay, so how accurate is my AC voltmeter? Well, I've done an experiment to compare it to the most accurate DMM that I have. Now, I certainly don't have a laboratory grade standard, but I do have an accurate DMM that I've compared to a calibrated 7.5 digit multimeter, and I know it's reading AC accurately to within a percent or so, which is plenty accurate for this type of application. So here's a plot of the data that compares my most accurate DMM reading and the dim bulb meter reading side by side. The x-axis is the scale on the variac, the y-axis is AC volts. The blue line represents the DMM measurement as a function of variac position, and the green line is the dim bulb meter. The difference between the two is a solid gray area here in the middle. As you can see, there's a bit of a swale to it, but overall it tracks to within a couple of volts over the useful range. I think that's pretty good for a home-built digital meter. I might be able to get it to track even closer by further adjustment of the two calibration pots in the meter, but at this point, I don't think that's worth the effort. Now, I said earlier that I punted on trying to explain the math for how the tester reacts to different loads, and what I've done instead is conduct two experiments, each one with a different size power resistor as the DUT. I used my best DMM to record the current flowing through the resistor. All right, now stick with me here. This first plot is the response for a 500 ohm resistor, which mimics a 30 watt DUT. The green line is the same as the prior plot. It's the meter reading versus variac position with no load, and I've included it here for reference. The orange and blue lines are the data for 60 watt and 100 watt light bulbs. As you can see, for lower levels of voltage, the voltage at the DUT tracks almost the same as the no load voltage, but starting at around 60 volts, they begin to diverge. What's happening is the bulb is getting hot enough to raise its resistance and start dropping more voltage across itself. And at around 90 volts for the 60 watt bulb, it is now hot enough to start visibly glowing. Note that the 100 watt light bulb never gets hot enough to glow visibly even at full variac output. Also notice that this data confirms what I said earlier, that the voltage drop across the bulb limits the voltage at the DUT. For the 60 watt bulb, the voltage at the DUT peaks at around 93 volts. For the 100 watt bulb, it's about 111 volts. The three dotted lines represent current. The red line is the current when the bypass switch is engaged, meaning the bulb is removed from the circuit. Again, orange represents the 60 watt bulb and blue the 100 watt. As you can see, the current starts to get limited at the same time the voltage starts to diverge. The second graph is the same as the first, except now I'm running the experiment with a 150 ohm resistor, which is mimicking a 100 watt DUT. And not surprisingly, the effects are more dramatic with this higher wattage load. Notice that we start to see divergence around 30 volts, both bulbs begin glowing much earlier, and the voltage to the DUT becomes severely limited. The current is also significantly limited as compared to the bypass position, and in fact actually decreases slightly as the bulbs become fully illuminated. Now I could do more experiments with even higher wattage bulbs and different dummy loads, but I think these two tell enough of the story to help me interpret bulb glow and meter readings, so I'm keeping copies of these two with my dim bulb tester for future reference. 
Okay, as I promised, here's a description of the AC voltmeter. The core idea comes from an article written by John Stanley, and like I said, I've included a link to John's work in the video description. I'll only describe the main function here and the changes that I've made. You can read John's article for more of the details on how it works. The first comment I would make on the circuit is to notice that the ground on the schematic is local ground for the AC meter circuit, and it's not connected to the dim bulb chassis nor the mains neutral. It's only connected to one side of the isolation transformer. This is important because making any connection from the local AC meter ground to the chassis ground would defeat the isolation transformer. That aside, here's how the circuit works. This section over here converts the input AC voltage to a DC voltage that's then applied to input pin number 4 of an LM319 comparator. As the AC increases from 0 volts to 150 volts, the DC voltage at pin number 4 increases from 1.65 to 3.3 volts. Next up is the first of two 555 timers. This one outputs two waveforms. The first is a sawtooth at a frequency of 12 Hz that varies in voltage the same range as the converted DC voltage, namely 1.65 to 3.3 volts, and is applied to input pin number 5 of the LM319 comparator. The second waveform is a very narrow square pulse, also at a frequency of 12 Hz. Note that I did swap the pin number 4 and number 5 assignments on the LM319 as compared to John's schematic. To this day, I still can't explain why I needed to reverse them, but I did. Otherwise, the circuit just wouldn't work. The logic seems to indicate John's version is right, but I couldn't get it to work without switching them. Moving on, the second 555 timer has a single output waveform, a square wave signal that runs at 2.2 kHz and is paralleled with the output of the LM319 comparator. So together, these circuit elements provide a series of pulses to the clock bus one pulse equating to one volt of AC input. The load bus is used as a reset signal to take the next sample reading. I changed the 555 frequencies from the article specified 500 Hz and 100 kHz to 12 Hz and 2.4 kHz. Reducing the frequencies was actually a recommendation from John to reduce display dithering and flickering. You can choose other frequencies, but they need to maintain the 200 to 1 ratio. I also revised the constant current circuit provided by the 2N3906 on the first timer by changing from a pot to discrete resistors to make it more stable. Switching now to the second sheet, here's where the clock pulse train is converted into the 2.5 segment display, a CD4518 counter, and two 74LS175s and one CD4013 flip-flops process and store the digital count and two CD4511 seven-segment display drivers converted to digits. Again, I refer you to John's article for a more detailed description that I'm just not going to get into here. Another change I made was to use individual 330-ohm resistors for each segment of the displays. It's not good practice to use a single resistor for a seven-segment LED display because the current increases with each segment you turn on, and using a single resistor causes the display to get dimmer with each new displayed segment. The last change I mentioned is there's a typo on pin number 1 of the CD4518 counter. I had to change it from 5 volts to ground to get the circuit to work. Before making the PCB, I built this circuit on breadboard and I'm glad I did. Otherwise, I wouldn't have found these issues and multiple board spins would have been needed. So that's it. That's my dim bulb tester. I hope you enjoyed watching the video. It's certainly one of the more valuable pieces of test equipment I have in my lab and it was a lot of fun to build it. It is obviously pretty heavy and it's not something I enjoy dragging out of the cabinet to use, but it's definitely useful when I'm working on an older piece of gear that I'm not quite sure if it's working right. And certainly if I'm building anything new, even like my spectrum analyzer, the first time that I powered up that AC to DC power supply, I used this, this guy to, to make sure that it was working right and not release that magic smoke. So until next time, bye for now.